Okay, so this is the first lecture for Thursday of week one. Okay, the second lecture. There's actually going to be two of these. Um, so we're going to focus on bioenergetics. So we're going to talk about ATP um, and how we generate ATP. We're also going to talk about how things move across the cell membrane. So for this lecture, we're going to talk about ATP and how we move things across the mem uh, cell membrane. Okay, notice that when it comes to moving material across cell membranes, there's actually four things that you'll want to know for each of the, I think there's six, six different uh, methods. All right, so to start off, what does ATP stand for? So ATP stands for, some, for adenosine triphosphate, and that's what we use to get energy. Okay, so each of these right here um, is a phosphate group. So we've got three, one, two, and three. Okay, and then the rest of this is a, a molecule called adenine. Okay, you'll never need to diagram this or anything like that, but that's why it's called adenosine triphosphate. So it's one adenosine molecule with three phosphate molecules. Okay, each of these lines, in case you haven't had chemistry, uh, signifies a chemical bond. And a chemical bond just means, um, or chemical bond is just where we have stored energy. All right, now the way we use ATP to get energy is, well, first of all, we have to form it. And so the way we do that is we take something called adenosine diphosphate. So it's just the same thing as this last slide here, only we don't have this, this end phosphate group. Okay. And so we add a phosphate, and the I just stands for inorganic. We're not going to get into that. And so what happens is, is that we form ATP, and we also form a little bit of water whenever this occurs. Okay? Now, when we need or we want energy, all we do is we break ATP down into ADP. Or in other words, we take that third phosphate group, and we break it off. We break that bond and um, energy is released, okay? Kind of the way to think about it with a chemical bond, um, I don't know if any of you have seen this gag gift. One of these days I'm going to get one and bring it into class, but like someone gives you like a soda can or something and you open the top of the soda can and like those springy, snaky things pop out, okay? Just think about the can as the bond, and when we open it, that releases that sp snake, springy, whatever you want to call it. That's the energy that's being released, Okay. Now your body actually contains very little ATP. Um, if it carried all the ATP that you'd need to function in a day, you'd have to weigh a whole lot. Um, and so what happens is, is that your body is constantly breaking down um, ATP and then recycling that ADP back into ATP. And it's hundreds of times a day that this happens to a single molecule. Okay. So we're going to keep it very basic with ATP. If you want to know more about ATP, that there's and there's a few things I'll say that about, especially with with uh, the, the Thursday material for week one. It's you know go take a biochem class because they really get into that the nitty gritty of that. Now, when it comes to movement, um, one of the core concepts uh, that some of you have talked about already, or will have talked about um, by the time we get to Thursday, is uh, cell to cell communication. Okay, and the cell membrane plays a huge role in this. Okay, the cell membrane, as you're probably aware, keeps things inside that we want to keep inside. It keeps things outside that we want to keep outside. But there are times where we want to bring stuff in or take stuff out. And we can do this a variety of ways. This is not, these are not the only ways, but these are six ways that we'll actually talk about as we go throughout the rest of the semester. So the first one is simple diffusion. Okay, now simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion are very similar. Okay, simple diffusion is just where an ion moves directly across the membrane. It's what we call lipid soluble. In other words, that means it can dissolve in fat. All right, it doesn't need a door. It can just go right through the wall. And so here we've got nearly headless Nick. And so when I think of simple diffusion, I think of nearly headless Nick. He's a ghost. He just goes wherever he wants. Facilitated diffusion, on the other hand, is uh, when an ion needs a protein, or in other words, ion needs a door. That protein is a door, okay? And so these are ions that aren't lipid sol soluble, or in other words, they can't dissolve in fat. Um, and the reason why they need to be able to dissolve in fat um, to be like nearly headless nick is that your cell membrane is essentially a layer of fat, 
okay? And so with ions that aren't lipid soluble, such as um, potassium, um, they need a door. If there is no door, they can't get in or get out. And then we've got active transport. Now active transport, we need a, we need a pump, okay? So a pump is a little bit different than a door. Hopefully if I gave you a picture of a pump and of a door, you'd be able to tell the difference. But in this case, we're going against the gradient. Now this might not mean a lot to you right now, but it will by the time you've taken um, or completed the first lab. Okay, one of the most important core concepts is something called flow down gradients. Things generally move from high to low, whether that's concentration, pressure, charge, whatever it is, it moves from high to low. Well, with active transport, we're going against the gradient. Okay, so think of going down a river, downstream versus upstream. Which one requires, will definitely require you to put some energy in if you're on the river? And the answer is if you want to go upstream, you have to paddle against it. Whereas if you're going downstream, you just float. You don't have to do anything. The river will take you downstream. So with active transport, we're going against the gradient. So we need a pump, and that pump needs energy to work. This leads us to osmosis. Now with osmosis, we have to understand the concept of osmolarity, and osmolarity is just a big fancy word for concentration. So how much of a substance do we have dissolved in a liquid? Okay, and so that substance we usually refer to as a solute. So just think salt, ion, protein, something like that. Okay, and so some examples of osmosis that we're going to talk about later is fluid moving into a capillary because of plasma proteins, or... Um, fluid moving out of what would eventually become urine because of the salt that's in um, your bloodstream. All right. Now, the way it works with osmosis is water is actually moving. Okay. So we've got this. Um, this we've got. This is where we start here. So I'm just going to put one, and then we've got two. So you notice here we've got the same amount of water, but We've got a much high concentration here, so I've got high and I've got low. Now notice the circles are bigger than the, the membrane, okay, the openings in the membrane. So this is what we call a semi-permeable membrane right there, okay. And so since the molecules can't go from their high gradient or high concentration to low concentration, what happens is the water actually moves. And so each ion will draw water towards it. And it's because there's so many more ions on the right side, they pull more water. And so we end up with different amounts of water on the right side than the left side, but now we've got equal concentrations. Okay? And so that's osmosis. Osmosis is m the movement of water. This doesn't require energy. Okay? And it can be a little confusing for students at times because the water is actually going from low concentration to high concentration. But because it's being pulled out, it's attracted to those, those salt ions, um, just naturally it doesn't require energy. Next we have something called exocytosis, and we'll talk about this, I believe, on Thursday of week two in a little more detail. Okay, But exocytosis um, is when we have molecules that are contained in something called a vesicle. Vesicle is just a big fancy name for a container. So right here on number two, we've got a vesicle that's got some molecules in it. When exocytosis occurs, this container moves to the, whoops, moves to the surface of the cell membrane and then basically releases its contents. This does not require ATP either. It happens naturally. Okay. Now what happens that before exocytosis can happen, there's got to be some sort of signal, and we'll talk about that um, when we talk about this in more detail. But once it gets that signal, the vesicle moves, it goes to the membrane, and it releases its contents. And we will talk, talk about this specifically when a neurotransmitter is released. The last one that we have to talk about is filtration. Okay, filtration is like osmosis in that it's the movement of fluid across the cell membrane. But in this case, it's not because of ions. It's not because we have a difference in concentration of ions. Instead, it's because of a difference in water pressure. Okay, I want you to think about a water bottle. Okay, so I'm going to draw my water bottle here, and I'm a terrible artist, but here's my water bottle, right? 
And we're going to say it's filled all the way to the top here. Okay, where is water pressure going to be the greatest? Is it going to be the greatest at this point here or at this point here? So we've got A, we've got B. Okay, so where is water pressure the greatest? And the answer is here at B. I'm going to have greater filtration um, force if there's an opening in the bottle because I've got all the weight of the water above it pushing down. Okay, this does not require ATP either. We just need to have the ability for water to leave. Okay, and so this happens all the time. Um, as blood enters into your capillary, a lot of that fluid from your plasma actually leaves the capillary. By the time the blood, the blood vessels are at the end of the capillary, a lot of that fluid's returned though. Okay, and so that is filtration. And so that's where we're going to end for right now so we don't make this too lengthy.